There certainly are a lot of different looking people in the world today. Can we explain this using the Bible? Once people spread out into many small clans, everything was set for specific groups to begin developing their own unique features. In the end, there is no such thing as race in science or in the Bible. All people are equal in God's eyes, and all of us need a Savior. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Races and the Bible with Dr. Robert Carter. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Robert Carter, did his undergraduate work at Georgia Tech and earned a PhD in marine biology from the University of Miami. Currently, He's a popular and much in-demand speaker for Creation Ministries International with its U.S. office in Atlanta, Georgia. As an active geneticist, his research centers on the field of human genetics, human history, and other issues related to biblical creation. Welcome to the show, Dr. Carter. Thank you. We are talking about races in the Bible, so I'm assuming that's going to be Elijah versus the chariot, correct? No, not that race. <laughs> well, what is it that Human we're races, talking about? Human race, skin color, and the way people look. Well, that's very important. We hear a lot about that today. What do you have to bring as far as science to speak to the idea of races in Scripture? The, the world of genetics is supporting the Bible in very surprising ways. And it's exciting, it's encouraging, and it's really nice to see that um, you know, the Bible is actually being validated with modern science. I do think that's very uh, encouraging to Christians. You know, we should believe because the Bible says so, but to be able to actually see it work out, you know, using the scientific method, using our reasoning, analyzing data, and see how creation itself confirms what Scripture says. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right in and see how it is that the Bible confirms what we're seeing now in genetics. All right, I want to set up a, a, a picture for everyone first. And before we get to the question of, you know, what does the Bible say about races or where do human races come from? We have to know what the Bible actually says about history. It claims to explain where everything came from and how old it is, including humanity and the rest of the universe. So with that starting point, the Bible's history book of the universe. Let's look and see what it has to say about the origin of people. And we will turn to Genesis chapter two, verse seven. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, most people have read that, or at least are familiar with the creation account, but this is saying directly that God did not create Adam from any other species. Humans are created specifically different. There's no common ancestry with chimpanzees here. And that's an important thing because a lot of evolutionists for a long time have tried to bin humans into different evolutionary categories with some being more advanced than others. It's not true. We did not come from apes. There are not some people more similar to apes than other people. We all came from Adam, and it was just a few thousand years ago. But Adam's only one person. We need a male and a female in order to have a human race, right? So we look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So now we have a male and a female. They can have children and we can be around today. But these are really stark statements in scripture. One man, one woman. In fact, that leads to testable predictions in science. There should only be one Y chromosome in the whole world. Oh, yeah, that's true. And there should only be one what's called a mitochondrial chromosome. It's a little piece of DNA we only get from our mothers. Yeah, that's true, too. 
there's a thing the evolutionists call Y chromosome Adam. Now they should call him Y chromosome Noah, but okay, they call him <laughs> Y chromosome Adam. And there's a thing they call y, uh, mitochondrial Eve, because they discovered there's only one male and one female ancestor. Dr. Carter, that flies in the Sir. face of a lot of, you know, at least what I've read, and I'm sure what a lot of in our in our audience have read, where you know maybe 200, 300,000 years ago, these different hominids, you know, gradually evolving. But we're seeing from Scripture, if we're going to take Scripture historically accurate, there is no process. There's the dust, and then there's a man. Correct? Absolutely right. The way they get the timing for the split is they're assuming humans and chimpanzees split like six million years ago. But if you actually look at the mutation rate that we see in the laboratory, Adam and Eve were not hundreds of thousands of years ago. We can account for the amount of differences we see in all people around the world in just a few thousand years using the known mutation rate. What does that mean, the mutation rate, the mutation weight of, of, of what? When DNA is copied from one generation to the next, those little machines make mistakes, just a couple of mistakes per person. But every generation, more mistakes build up. And so if you take that Y chromosome that's handed from a father to a son, to the grandson, to the great grandson, every once in a while, a spelling mistake occurs. And if we look at all the people alive today and look at all the differences in that Y chromosome, we can say, how long would it take to accumulate all those differences? And the answer is not hundreds of thousands of years. Adam is much younger than that. And so is Eve. That's fascinating. So science itself is more in line with scripture than what evolutionary science would have us believe. Yes. And this did not, now evolution can explain these things. I mean, they, they come up with these fanciful uh, human models and how what happened back in Africa, but they had to do that after the fact. This is a direct prediction from scripture that is true in science. It's not a prediction of evolutionary theory at all. It was actually a surprise to find these things. And it's really exciting that science is validating the Bible in these ways. Mm. So now that we understand Adam and Eve, we get to ask two questions, two interesting questions. The first one is, if we arose from two people, how different could people be today? Well, the answer to that is not very much because two people only have a limited amount of genetic diversity. And it turns out that humans across the world only have a limited amount of genetic diversity. The second question is, how could people be so different? Because there are differences between people if we only came from Adam and Eve? Well, so the answer to that is we use genetics. We have time and chance, we have genetic drift, we have a little bit of natural selection, we have mutation. We can use genetics to explain why there are differences between the people around the world. But before we get there, we have to hit a couple of other important biblical events. One is called Noah's Flood. Now, hopefully the listeners are, are familiar with this. If not, you can go to the book of Genesis and read it for yourself. But the Bible claims that all people in the world got reduced to eight people, Noah and his family. And those eight people are the founders of the entire modern world. So we have to be able to count for seven billion people today, starting with only eight. The Bible also says this in Genesis chapter nine. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These three were the sons of Noah and from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. That is saying very clearly, there are only three founding couples in the world, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives. We had to pack all the genetics of all the people, Africans, Chinese, Native Australians, Native Americans, Europeans. We had to pack them into six people. Can we do it? Yes, we can. But there's one more biblical account we need to take care of before we get there. Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose tops in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11, 7 and 8 says, come, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. Essentially, God said this and he spread the people out across the world. Now, interestingly, the evolutionists have their own story very similar to this, but they start in Africa. But wait a second. They're claiming here that in the fairly recent past, even for the evolutionists, the out of Africa theory is, is recent for them. There was a small population of people with 
one Y chromosome and one mitochondrial ancestor, and they went through the Middle East and spread out to the entire world, into the uninhabited world. Wow. Every single one of those points is the direct thing we would predict from the Tower of Babel account. The evolutionist has the same story, but they put the origin in Africa. And of course, they can't put it in the Middle East because that sounds too much like the Bible. <laughs> why Africa? Well, because they assume we evolved from monkeys. That's the hugest driver right there. The, the assumption that we arose from a common ancestor with chimpanzees. And chimpanzees live in Africa, so they put our origin in Africa. But the rest of the story sounds very much like what the Bible says. Okay, now that we have the biblical story put together, we can now address the question, where did the so-called races come from? And I'll give you several possibilities. One, something called a genetic bottleneck. When God took that population and divided it into smaller populations, well, each little, each little clan that's going away from Babel is not going to have all of the genes that that first population had. And so if that population, we can represent it as a jar of marbles. You see all the different colored marbles in the jar. Well, the subpopulation, one of those clans coming away from Babel, we're going to shake a couple of marbles out into a little cup. That's the subpopulation. And you can see that over time, that little population might grow, but the final genes in the population can only represent the starting genes. This is called the founder effect. A population can only have the genes that it was founded with. So we would automatically expect, depending on the size of the populations after Babel and how far apart they spread and how quickly they got away from other populations, that each little group is only going to have some of the genes that are in the population before Babel. So if any of those genes affect the way people look, we have an ability for the so-called races to develop very quickly. The second big idea for the development of races is called inbreeding. And I'm, I'm showing you here a family tree of the 12 tribes of Israel. In brown, those are all the people that, that contributed to the 12 tribes at the bottom. They start with Terah, the father of Abraham. Abraham married his sister, Sarah, half-sister Sarah. Their son Isaac was genetically equivalent to a son of Terah because he got a double dose of Terah's DNA. Well, Isaac married his first cousin once removed and first cousin twice removed at the same time, times two, Rebecca. I mean, it's almost like marrying a sister. Their son Jacob married his first cousins, Rachel and Leah, but they're most, much closer than first cousins because they inherited Terah's DNA in multiple different ways. This is a huge amount of inbreeding. By the time you get down to the 12 brothers, you know, Joseph and Benjamin and Levi and Judah and, you know, the 12 brothers, they don't have 3% of Terah's DNA. That's how much they should have after that many generations. Because you only get half of your parents' DNA and a quarter of your grandparents and, a, and an eighth of your great-grandparents. By the time you get down this many generations, they should have about 3% of Terah's DNA. Instead, they have about 22%. And because of the laws of genetics, about half of that, they have exactly the same copy on both their chromosomes. So if there's a gene that affects the way they look, their height, their bill, their, the curliness of their hair, the color of their hair, the shape of their eyes, the color of their skin, all those brothers could quite possibly share exact copies of that gene. So you could literally be walking down the street of some ancient village and be like, oh yeah, there's an Israelite right there. You could pick them out of a crowd because of this inbreeding. But things like this were happening not just among the Israelites. It's happening in every ancient village in the ancient world. Most people throughout history have married someone born less than five miles away from where they were born. So what happens is you get endogamy, you get inbreeding, you get people only getting genes from close to related people. And that right there, the founder effect and inbreeding over time would naturally lead to different populations starting to look a little bit different. Quickly, we don't need millions of years, we don't need evolution. We just need this basic biblical idea. Now, very interesting, modern genetics has come in a big circle. Back in Charles Darwin's day, he was trying to divide people up into different races, different species even, and put them on an evolutionary ladder with white people at the top and black people at the bottom. And all the people in between were evolutionarily in order. 
Well, that's awful. And it's also not true. Scripturally, it's completely fallacious. And scientifically, it doesn't work either. I'm going to use a big word here. Phenotypic. Ugh. You remember back in high school biology, you learned about the genotype. That's the genes an individual carries. And the phenotype, that's the way someone looks. So the phenotypic differences are the, the differences between the way people look around the world. Luis Quintana Mercy, famous geneticist, says this. The genes that explain the differences between the way people look, the phenotypic differences between populations, only represent a tiny part of our genome, confirming once again the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. Therefore, there's no race in science and there's no race in the Bible. We need to let go of the word. It has no basis in reality. Dr. Carter, let me stop you right there. This is really fascinating. Stay with us. You're going to want to see what comes next. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. Robert Carter and he's been sharing about races in the Bible. Dr. Carter, we left off with you saying how the vast majority of uh, the peoples in the earth have a lot of the same DNA, and yet we look very different because of these uh, different genetic reasons. Uh, where can you take us then from here about these other people? I want to turn to some ideas that are floating around in the culture that are incredibly wrong and very destructive because I want to address them directly. Now, some of the long age evolutionists who are also Christians, they think that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and there's other people outside the garden. It's just not true because there are no other people. There's no one outside the garden. Let me read Genesis chapter four, verse 12 and 14. Uh, this is God talking to Cain after Cain killed Abel. He says this, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Well, the question is, who are these people he's talking about? Right after this, Cain has a wife, he has a son, he builds a city. You don't build cities unless there's lots of people. So it's this big conjecture of all these other people that are supposedly there. But I'm going to turn around this way. The next time statement in the Bible is that Adam knew his wife and she bore Seth. And Adam was 130 years old. Seth, that word almost means replacement. It's like Cain kills Abel, Seth is born, and Eve names him replacement. In other words, he's the first son born after Abel dies. Well, he's not the third child. I mean, if he's the third child, Eve's only having children every 43 and a third years. That's a long space between children. No, Adam and Eve are probably great, great grandparents by the time Seth is born. Meaning that there's tons of people in the world for Cain to marry. He could have had a wife. He could also have been a father before this. He could have been a grandfather before this. 130 years is a long time. The Bible says Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. There's not other people. Adam and Eve really are the first and only people in the world. It's an older idea in, um, in science and theology. It's called polygenesis. Polygenesis is the idea that God created separate peoples. Monogenesis is we all came from Adam and Eve. The polygenesis idea is not right. Scripture is not right. Scientifically, it's not right. There's no reason to hold to it. I wrote a long article on creation.com, how old was Cain when he killed Abel, when I explain all these things. And when you get the answer to that, you can answer questions like, where'd Cain get his wife? It was his sister. She didn't come from an outside population because we have so much time for children to be born and for the population to start to grow. And another idea that comes up a lot, what about mixed race marriages? Now, interestingly, the younger population today, they don't care. I see mixed race couples everywhere I go, and I live in West Georgia. This is a very, uh, the history of this area is not good as far as race relations go, shall we say. And yet the younger people, it, it's over for them. They don't see skin color like older people tend to do. 
But if you just think about mixed race marriages in the Bible, I mean, Abraham had servants from Egypt. Joseph married an Egyptian. Moses married a Midianite and probably a Cushite because uh, Aaron and Miriam were teasing him for his Cush Cushite wife. He might have two wives. Rahab was a Canaanite. Ruth was a Moabite. Bathsheba's husband was a Hittite. There are tons, I mean, literally hundreds of mixed race marriages in the Bible. God does not care about race. He cares about faith. And that's important. It, it wasn't that God forbade Israel to marry other peoples because of different races. It was because they didn't believe in God. It was a religious yes. re reason why he forbade yes. made that. I, I documented on, on creation.com, just type in Israelite genetic mixing. I documented all of the examples I could find. And I document a lot. In fact, there's two of that I know that I missed. Little little things in, in the Old Testament, like in Second Chronicles or something. Oh, I forgot that guy. But there's so many that I listed, I didn't have to have every single one of them. It is clear that there should not be any Jewish DNA today. They're Middle Eastern because they intermarry with all the people around them. And it happened all throughout Israelite history. Okay, let's ask this question then. Now that we have a pretty good idea of what the Bible says about where people came from, what would Adam and Eve have looked like? Well, I'll tell you what, that's not Eve. <laughs> And that's not Adam. <laughs> these two lovely people, these are very beautiful people. They're at the opposite ends of the color spectrum of humanity. That boy produces as much eumelanin as human skin can produce. That woman produces almost no eumelanin, but a little bit of pheomelanin, so she has this reddish color. How do we get people like this if we just start from Adam and Eve? Easy. We just have Adam and Eve have these genes for these skin colors within them. And then at Babel, when we separate, as I said earlier, each little population only gets a subset of the genes. So creationists have been saying for decades that Adam and Eve would have been middle brown. Genetics backs that up. If they had the skin color genes, the hair color genes, the eye color genes of modern people within them all at the same time, they would have been in the middle. They would have been white. They wouldn't have been black. They would have been in the middle. And we can explain everyone in the world just from that. But interestingly, if we've only been around the, for maybe 4,500 years since Noah's flood, that's only about 150 generations. If you want to stretch it, maybe 200 generations in some family lines. That's not a long time, which means we are all kissing cousins. If we haven't been around for millions of years, we're all very closely related. I would like to wrap up this discussion with a couple of verses. The first is Colossians 3.11. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Within Christianity, already early on when Colossians was written, we had all these different so-called races, and they're all considered equal because we're all in Christ. There are no racial divisions within Christianity. And I want to point you to Isaiah 59, 20. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. Well, in the New Testament, we talk about us being redeemed in Christ. But wait a second. How can I be redeemed if I'm not related to that redeemer? This word redeemer is the same word used in the book of Ruth about Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. In Jewish law, if you owed a debt and Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, she had sold her land and spent the money. She wanted her land back. She didn't have any money. So a kinsman could come in and redeem the debt that she owed. That was Boaz. But I'm not related to Boaz. I'm not related to Jesus. He was Jewish. I have no Jewish DNA in me. How can I come into this, this, this number, this redeemed people? Well, the answer is I'm related to Jesus through our mutual ancestor, Adam. We have the first Adam, we have the last Adam. The last Adam paid that debt. Therefore, I, the non-Jewish person, can be saved and can go to heaven. You know, it's wonderful to see how what we're looking at when it comes to creation and the human race and the different uh, ways in which it has divided 
really does bring us ultimately to the gospel. If there was no historical Adam, if we didn't all descend from him, then we're all not in need of, of redemption because it was the curse of Adam that brought sin to all of us. And it's through the redemption of Christ, as you said, that we all can be saved. Well, Dr. Carter, I want to thank you for being with us today. It was really fascinating. I hope you'll be able to join us again on another program. I would love to. Well, today, as you saw, we talked about whether or not what we see in the world regarding the races, is that confirmed in Scripture? Does Scripture line up with the advancing science of genetics? And fascinatingly, what we're seeing more and more is that the more the science of genetic progresses, the more we go back to the truths of the Bible. It just goes to show that what we know what the Bible says is true and the proof, it's all around you. I want to thank you for joining us. And I also want to remind you that if you enjoy Origins, we could really use your help. It takes a lot of money and a lot of prayer, a lot of time to put these programs on the air. Won't you consider supporting this program prayerfully and financially? Join with us so that we can continue to make a big impact and show how awesome our Creator is. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this program, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 2008, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.